For Krima Media in Johannesburg, this is Sane Lamini. Joining me today is award-winning mountaineer and a Guinness World Record holder, Sarah Kumalo, to discuss her book titled, My Journey to the Top of the World. So you are the first Black African woman to reach the summit of the Mount Everest. This book details your story of climbing, but, but before it all began, you escaped death in August 2016. Can you briefly tell us about that? 2016, the 8th of August, I was uh, in that year, I couldn't afford to go back to Everest because um, as you probably read, uh, I wasn't funded. So I was asking for a sponsorship. No one was funding me. I didn't have enough. So I decided that I'll just use it to train. And I was uh, part of a team who were doing a race called 12 Legends, which is a, um, a, a cycling um, a race. We raced, I think the first day we did about 60 kilometers. The next day, 34 kilometer. I remember coming down with my bicycle and um, I failed to break because my back brakes were gone. Uh, and I hit on a rock, cracked my head quite badly and um, broke my arm and I was unconscious. I woke up almost three weeks later uh, in Mill Park because um, it landed me in a coma. And after your recovery, uh, you were not like uh, put down that uh, this was something that you were not going to do. You you gained your strength and then you entered the Soweto Marathon, which you won. And you say in a book, it was a victory and a turning point for you. I actually had the, the entry before the, the fall. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I went, honestly, to just do a 21 uh, but when I got there, I thought, you know, I've got a 42 entry. Why not? Um, and I finished it. It was a turning point because until then I had, uh, so coming out of a coma when I was getting consciousness, I was confused. I didn't know where I was. So I pulled the tubes. This, this wasn't my voice. And, and I broke vocal cords. Um, and I thought I couldn't breathe as normally as I did. And, and going back to Everest was not even in question at that point because breathing becomes key, especially with the reduced oxygen. Now, running 42 and successfully doing so gave me ideas that maybe I could go back. You know, it was on a Sunday and on a Monday, I was at Mill Park to say, listen, I ran 42, surely I can still climb. <laughs> you know, I went back. I think it's really a testament of um, how I grew up. You know, my mother always used to say, no one owes you anything and nothing is for granted. If it doesn't work out, figure out what you've learned from it and keep going, you know, and, and, and that's my mantra now. You know, um, I don't believe anything happens to me. Things happen for me. And I'm obsessed about finding what I've learned from them and use them to move forward because they happened for me so that I can be stronger. Uh, I'm a Christian, so I go to Jeremiah 29 verse 11, which says, so I know the plans that I have for you and it's plans to prosper you. It's not happening to me so that it keeps me down. It happens to me so that when I get up, I get up stronger, a lot more wiser, um, and I get up for success, for prosperity that I've been promised. And now also being raised by your grandparents, I felt like it's also had an valuable input in, in your upbringing. Yes, absolutely. My grandparents were missionaries, uh, very much social conscious um, that they had. Um, my grandfather would preach. My grandmother, she was a vegetarian. So she had gardens that she used to make us work in uh, and would harvest more than we need. Um, and you know, she would share that with some of the people in the church that needed it or in the community. One of the big lessons that I learned from her, although as a young child, you don't really like it. Someone knocks on the door and you all have food and everything is dished out. She redistributes, <laughs> you know, and that was my grandmother. And, and she had this thing, I didn't put that in the book, where she would say, it is all going to the toilet. So who cares who takes it there, you know? So it's really that spirit of Ubuntu. I am because you are. And I think many times as people that are in town now, we've lost that, you know. We, we're not weaker because we've helped other people. And, and that's one thing when I got to the top of the world to realize that there's not only a space for one person, there's a space for many people, uh, which is why I ended up with my book. If you reach there, put your, the ladder down and get someone else mm-hmm. up, you know. 
you've also raised millions for grassroots education. Can you briefly tell us about that and why education? Absolutely. I, I think in 2009, I elaborated that I lost my older sister and I started asking myself my reason for being. And uh, I don't know how other people process things. For me, I went back to when I was a child, when I was happy, when everything I thought was mine, you know, and, and the image of my grandfather saying, if you don't live a life of service, it's life wasted came to my mind. The image of my mother saying reach for the skies because the sky is the limit came to my mind. And the answer to both those questions was like, I'm not successful because I'm not living a life of service. You know, I, I, like, who am I saving? I'm just getting a salary, getting a car, getting a house. It's just about me, my family, and that's it. Um, so I went back there to, um, you know, giving back. And it was compounded with a child from a home that we're supporting, telling me that, you know, asking whether I came from the township because people like us don't do things like this. We, we don't raise enough money to help other people to that extent. You know, that reminded me of me growing up watching cartoons, those Superman, Wonder Woman, and thinking <laughs> they are epic, but they don't look like me. So I can never be a superhero. Um, a sense of self-disbelief that a lot of us have. Um, and that we, we kind of need to to eliminate for the next generation. They can be anything. They too can step on top of the world. Uh, and that started my journey to climb the seven high peaks, but use it to raise money for education. So I love climbing because I enjoyed Kili, um, but I'm gonna do it, but I'll use it to, to raise money for education because it's the equalizer, which is why I called my summits, summits with a purpose. I'm not summiting to take a selfie, I'm summiting, but I'm gonna make a change in my world because you also realize that we don't have forever. You know, we're here for a moment, but what have we done while we were here? And for me, if it's changing one child's life, I would like, I'll be honored to, to be able to do that. And I'm sure along the way, there were people uh, who would tell you that this is a, not an easy task to, to finish, but you kept on going. Would you mind sharing what kept you going? So it, never mind that it's not an easy, it's uh, I can't do it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. It's assuming that if they see me on the trail to Everest Base Camp, I must be going to Everest Base Camp. I can't be going to the summit. I think that for me, um, Sane, changed something. I realized then that I'm not given the same benefit of a doubt that a white male rich is given. He is assumed he must be going to the top of the world, but I'm assumed I'm going to Everest Base Camp. Why? We need to change that. Um, you know, so it, it, it created, initially, I had almost an imposter syndrome, like maybe I don't belong. Um, and I just fought back. I belong where I want to belong. This is my father's world. You know, I just need to work harder. Uh, and so that's why, when it didn't work out, apart from the education, is the representation. It was important for me to go back and back and back using the learnings from every challenge that I got. I'm grateful for the unsuccessful attempts because they humbled me. You know, they made me appreciate the summit in 2019 a lot more than I would have if I just got the summit at one time. Before reaching that uh, stage of being now a, a one of the people that have achieved such a remarkable uh, challenge, there were people uh, behind the scenes who were helping you to finish this amazing task. Would you mind sharing uh, about Busiso, who I feel like has played a huge role in your success? So th there is many people. Um, Busiso I met in 2012 when I was trying to figure out how do you climb the seven summits. Um, the first person to tell me that... Um, no black African woman has summited Everest because until 2013, I didn't know that. Uh, is Luazingwenya. He passed away and he believed that I was going to be the first black African woman, even when I didn't believe it, you know. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Um, there is also a Barry Swartzberg, the only person that actually, we walked into his office. He uh, and Adrian Go started um, Discovery. Uh, and uh, he looked at us and he gave us money, Luazi and I. He just said, you guys are crazy. How, what, what, uh, what makes you think that you can do this? And, uh, you know, what's the plan? We shared the plan. And he said, okay, he gave us 250,000 rand each. And um, 
And, and obviously, Sibusiso in 2014, I went with him, uh, which was an unsuccessful uh, climb. My family, you know, you, you think you are climbing alone, but the people at home are worried because people die on that mountain. If anything had to happen to me, it's my children and my family that would have suffered. So the sacrifice and their, their patience with me when I tried to follow my dream is commendable. Um, you know, and, and I'm grateful for that. In 2019, when I eventually went to, to the summit, uh, it was Vimo, so I didn't have enough money. Vimo gave me less than half of the money that I needed. But more importantly, the shepherds uh, that are the unsung heroes of the mountain. We all go up there and we produce these pictures, but nobody gets to the top alone. And what did you say to someone who may be going through a tough time in whatever that they are doing, uh, which could be similar to uh, achieving this remarkable uh, achievement? This too shall pass. That, that's very important. Nothing lasts forever. Uh, be patient, uh, but don't be complacent. You know, um, keep working. The world might not, might seem like they are not watching, but they are watching you. I went to Everest on my own with only my family and my friends at the airport saying goodbye. But when I came back, the nation knew about me and knew about what I had done. So the world is watching. Keep going. Keep doing what you love doing and trust in the process. But more importantly, trust God. And lastly, if I may ask, uh, Sissy, what else will the readers get if they were to buy this book? I think there's a lot, but I want to read the last uh, paragraph, which is my favorite. <laughs> um, but it's, it's one I want to leave people with. It says, every one of us has his or her own personal mountain to climb. It might not be Everest, and it might not be a physical mountain. Yours might be in the boardroom, on a bicycle, in your family, at school, or even in the health of your own body. The reality is there's always something we need to achieve, something big, something difficult, something meaningful. Whatever it is, continue to believe in your limitless potential because the summit is possible if you keep stepping. I believe that we are all extraordinary and they have the capacity to do extraordinary things in our lifetime. Whatever your personal Everest, I wish you strength, purpose, kind weather, and some luck, but more importantly, God's blessing. When you get there, remember to be thankful and reach down and pull someone else up with you. That was the first Black African woman to reach the summit of the Mount Everest, Sarah Kumalo, in conversation with Polity about her book titled My Journey to the Top of the World.